Waypoint Church Ministries um, are, is an organization that this church has been supporting, believe it or not, since its inception. Namely because this was the very first church that they ever planted. Um, we were the starting point for this group. So we are very happy to have Neil Wheeler come and share our time of message this morning to both share from God's word and to um, kind of deliver us an update on how things are going with Waypoint, especially during the middle of all of the pandemic and restrictions that we've had. So please welcome Neil, Neil Wheeler. Thank you, Barry. Appreciate it so much and glad to be with y'all here. <clears throat> In, uh, at Parkview here in uh, Stanton. I was here, was it two years ago that you had your 75th anniversary? Four years ago. Like I said, I was here four years ago and uh, I remember that time uh, and it was a wonderful time. I remember uh, having my picture taken with y'all out on the front porch and that was a great thing uh, and I want to congratulate you uh, on your uh, ministry now for 79 years, I I'm guessing, uh, and that is uh, uh, powerful. And uh, the thing that jumped at me that day uh, was the cost to start uh, Stanton Church of Christ, now Parkview. Uh, it was less than $15, if I remember right. Uh, but that investment that uh, uh, VEF, now Waypoint, uh, made uh, has resulted in well over 500 baptisms. And that is fantastic. Uh, down through the years, and that's great. I've shared uh, y'all's story lots of times with lots of different people, uh, and I'm just glad to be able to be with you today. Talk a little bit about Waypoint, but much more importantly, about what God's doing, uh, it seems, during this uh, COVID uh, issue. Uh, the text that I'm going to use this morning uh, is on the screen. Uh, uh, John chapter 1, verse 14. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me. And I'll be turning to several passages of Scripture this morning. You can turn if you care to. Uh, the title of my message is God with us. God with us. Uh, the, the story, and this is simply called the Gospel of Christmas Day, referred to in the church, on the church calendars, the Gospel of Christ, Christmas Day, says, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The question I have for you today is, is God still with us today? And the answer to that is absolutely he is. And I want to talk to you uh, about that uh, this morning. Since 1938, uh, VEF, now Waypoint, has been uh, pursuing kingdom growth first here in Virginia and now all around uh, the Mid-Atlantic region, the states that are shown there. Uh, and we pursue kingdom growth in two ways. Number one, through church planting. Uh, you guys were the very first, as Barry mentioned, uh, the very first of the VEF, now Waypoint, church plants. Uh, but since that time, we have had dozens and dozens and dozens of church plants. Since 1990, we've had 45 uh, churches uh, planted strategically. And I want to uh, focus you on two numbers. The bottom number, uh, 555, that was the number that was uh, baptized during 2019. The number 8,000 is the number of people that have accepted Jesus and been baptized in Christ since 1990 alone in one of our church plants. The question is, so what are we going to be doing in the future? Are we uh, just kind of uh, placing a pause on what we're trying to do in church planting? And the answer to that is absolutely no. We're going to be planting two churches domestically in North Carolina uh, and uh, uh, in Goldsboro, uh, as well as uh, in Lake Norman, uh, North Carolina, near Charlotte, uh, and Goldsboro's right on 95. We're excited about both of those church plants, and they're going to do a fantastic job. But during 2021, we will also be partnering with uh, the International Conference on Missions as it comes back to Richmond again in 2021 uh, in November. And what we will do, we have already uh, selected four different, actually five different church planting uh, organizations that we're going to be partnering with uh, to start churches globally. As you notice on the map, uh, they were, there will be an international project in, uh, in North Carolina, Raleigh. Uh, there will be five churches planted in Mexico, 
five churches planted in Ghana, West Africa, five churches planted in Central Asia, and five churches planted through a ministry in Moldova in Eastern Europe. I, I hope that you can come next November, some of you, uh, to ICOM in Richmond. It's an exciting uh, time where missionaries from all over the world and mission-minded people from all over the world gather together so as a result of that, we will be planting Waypoint through uh, the missions dollars of, of churches just like Parkview. We'll be planting 23 churches globally. Uh, I think that deserves an amen. <coughs> I believe that's an exciting goal, and uh, we're excited about what God is going to be doing with us next year. So the first thing that we do is plant churches uh, 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 around the region. The second thing that we do is also to help churches navigate ministry during changing times. Has anybody realized that this has been a challenging season? Anybody? This has been challenging uh, in so many different ways. I was thinking the other day about some of the changes that have come about uh, that the church had to navigate through uh, since 1938. A bunch of them. World War II was one of those things. Uh, multiple uh, global uh, military actions and the 9-11 terrorist attacks. But we've also navigated through things <clears throat> right here at home uh, as well that have impacted the church in a dramatic way. Do you remember the first time you ever ate at a fast food restaurant? McDonald's or uh, Burger King? That happened since 1938. And that has changed the way we do church in many different ways because we want everything fast. And a lot of people think that spirituality ought to happen and, and spiritual growth ought to happen fast, just instantaneously, but it does not. Uh, we uh, have found the opening of mega Walmart stores uh, in our area uh, and, uh, as well as mega churches. And what does that look like for the rest of us? I never preached in a mega church. Uh, I preached 43 years in two uh, churches. Uh, and uh, uh, how does that impact uh, the churches that we uh, worship in? Online shopping. Last Sunday morning, I needed a new pair uh, of shoes. Well, I needed them before last Sunday morning, but I was up really early, and my wife said, you ought to go uh, to DSW, their website, and order them online. You can pick them up. So I did. I ordered my shoes about 6 o'clock Sunday morning, and while I was sitting in church in a church in Goochland, Virginia, uh, my phone started vibrating. I looked at it. You shouldn't do that in church. I know that, but I did. And I had a text from that that store saying my shoes are ready to pick up and I thought isn't this crazy and I got them on on the way home but also online churches and I too want to say welcome to all those individuals that are worshiping online uh, and you are joining just uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people all across our country during since 1938 We've uh, had to navigate through school integration. I remember that so very well. Uh, abortion, legalized abortion, moon landings. I remember uh, where I was when John Glenn went into space. I remember so well because I was sicker than sick. I had the measles, and my mom said, get up out of bed. That's when you had one TV, black and white, Come into the living room, you got to watch this. This is important. And I watched it go up, and I said, I feel so bad. Can I go back to bed? Moon landings happened. Uh, we also uh, had jet travel. I remember when I was a kid growing up in Salem, Virginia, going to the Roanoke Airport and watching planes take off. And I never dreamed in my wildest imagination that I would ever get on an airplane. Never, never dreamed it. I was like, you know, just a little bitty guy, four years old, uh, three, four years old, something like that. I have literally flown all the way around the world. And that's absolutely crazy. Halfway around the world, going across the Pacific to Indonesia, uh, I'm sorry, to uh, Australia on a mission trip, and halfway around the world, uh, going to a mission trip in Indonesia, going across the Atlantic and Europe and Asia, and that is crazy. The Internet. Anybody ever heard of Facebook? Instagram? iPhones have all impacted our lives like crazy, and they've impacted the church as well. 
But my friends, I want you to understand that no more stressful season since 1938, there's never been as stressful a season as this season during COVID-19. And the issue is nobody expected it. This time last year, if you'd have said, we're going to shut down everything next year and all be locked down wearing masks, uh, you'd look at me like I had two heads, you know? But that's reality today. You know, I uh, hang with ministers all the time. Uh, my job with Waypoint Church Partners is, is uh, pastor care. And so I, I'm able to drink coffee and uh, make phone calls. And I connect with uh, several dozen ministers every single week. And uh, my question to every one of them is always, how are you doing? Not what are you doing, because ministers are smart. They can figure out what to do. But how are you doing? I found it very interesting to notice the change of that answer through COVID. In the first month or month and a half, every minister I talked to was excited about uh, all of this new technology that we're learning, online worship or uh, in parking lot church. Uh, they, they were excited. Then about month two, that excitement changed to frustration. As ministers realized, hey, this is for real. And some people aren't going to come back to church. And this is strange. And how are we going to navigate ministry now? About August, every single minister, starting in August, every single minister that I talked to, uh, and all the way up till today, always answer the question, how are you doing? I am exhausted. Anybody exhausted with COVID? Just tired of it? I want you to understand that your pastor is absolutely so. Bob Russell did uh, a report on a survey uh, several, uh, th uh, two years ago, uh, that stated that 43%, and this was a survey among Christian church ministers, and it found that 43% of active ministers, this was two years ago, uh, uh, said that they were seriously considering leaving ministry. I just read the other day that that number is now, hold on to your, uh, 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 to your pants, 70 plus percent of ministers saying, if I could do anything else, I would try to do something else. I visit, uh, I attend about 40 different churches a year all across our region, and I want to tell you that tension in the church has never been higher than it is right now today. Wear a mask, uh, opening protocols, I even heard I had lunch, had coffee last week with one minister that described uh, the uh, the Facebook post between two of his church member families who were j just totally uh, opposite on their political views, and one of them finally posted and announced to everybody, "I'm going to find a new church uh, because of what that family believes." Now, since March, I've been asking myself a question, and that question is. What is God up to during COVID in regard to his church? I've thought a lot about what Satan's up to as well, but I, more importantly, I've been asking myself over and over and over again, what is God up to? Because God's always up to something. Nothing takes God by surprise. And my question is, what is God up to during COVID in regard to his church? I just want to share with you three conclusions that I've come to and answer to that question. The first conclusion that I've come, in, uh, come to is that social distancing is intensifying our longing for divine closeness. Social distancing, anybody tired of that word? Social distancing is intensifying our desire for divine closeness, just to be with God. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 11 says that God has set eternity in the, heart, in the human heart. That means that every person you pass in Stanton this week, every single one of them, every person alive on planet Earth, has an intense longing in their heart, even if they don't understand what it's all about, for eternity. For God, a divine closeness. You know, we've been bombarded, haven't we, with COVID statistics and, uh, for months now. But we've heard very little talk about the mental and emotional fallout of separating ourselves from one another. Pre-COVID, uh, statistics uh, were that 25% of Americans pre-COVID uh, suffered or dealt with some sort of mental disorder. 
uh, uh, most of them would be uh, either uh, a strong uh, depression or anxiety issues. In June, the CDC came out with the number uh, that they said of people who were seriously considering taking their own lives. This was in June. They said 11% of Americans were seriously considering. That's up from the normal average of 3.5% of people. Do you understand what I just heard? More than one out of every 10 people that you will pass this week is seriously thinking about taking their own, law, their own life. Clinicians tell us that the most uh, important therapy for any sort of, of mental or emotional issue is human touch. Human touch, being with somebody else. Oh, I long so much, long so much to shake hands again, to hug again, to be able to see smiles again rather than just, you know, the tweaks of people's eyes, but, but to be in contact with people. But most of all, I long from, for a touch from the Lord Jesus himself. God with us. You know, Jesus, when he was on earth, had the uh, remarkable abil ability to touch a lot of people's lives. Did you realize that? An interesting read for you would be to read through the Gospels and notice the number of times that Jesus touched people and healed them or that people touched him. I want to share just a, a, a four examples of those. In the Gospel of Luke, if you're in John, you could turn back to the Gospel of Luke, the fifth chapter. Uh, here's one uh, story. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, the fifth chapter, in verse 12, it says, While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand, watch this, and he touched the man. I'm willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Or in the next chapter, chapter 6 and uh, verse 17, it says, Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. And a large crowd of his disciples was there. Then a great number of people from all over Judea and from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon uh, who had come to hear Jesus and to be healed of their diseases. And those that were troubled by impure, uh, impure spirits were cured. And the people all tried, watch this, to touch him because power was coming out from him uh, and healing them all. Our chapter, uh, uh, the, the next chapter is chapter 7 and verse 11. The scripture says that Jesus was there coming on a village uh, called Nam, and as he was walking, he noticed uh, that uh, there was a uh, funeral procession. And Jesus, knowing all things, understood that this was uh, the person who died was the son of a widow who, uh, whose husband had already died. Verse 14, it says, Then he went up and he touched the bier that they were carrying the man on, and the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. One last is found in uh, chapter 8. Uh, I could go on and on and on, but in chapter 8, in verse 42, it says, As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, and no one could hear her. And she came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately... Her bleeding stopped. Why were people wanting to touch Jesus? Well, according to an Old Testament prophecy found in Numbers chapter 15 and Malachi chapter 4, uh, the prophecy was that when the Messiah came, his touch would heal. His touch would have miraculous power. And so people flocked to Jesus when he was on earth for his divine touch. I believe with all of my heart, with all of my heart, that when people are so tired of social distancing as they are today, the Lord himself is using that to intensify our longing for a touch from him. 
for his divine touch. Social distancing, number one, is intensifying our longing for divine touch. But secondly, uh, the second uh, uh, observation I have is that people aren't flocking back to church to receive Jesus' touch today, and it may not be their fault. 25% of people, it is, we are told, will likely never come back to church. 25% of folks that were here with you before COVID began will likely never come back to church. That's a startling number, but it is reality, and I'm seeing it across uh, our region. In 2 uh, second, second, uh, Timothy uh, chapter 4, Paul writes uh, to young Timothy, a preacher, and he describes... Uh, our day, our last days, uh, he describes those days this way. When he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, to Timothy, he says, preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Watch this. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teaching to say what their itching ears want to say, want to hear. My friends, I want you to understand that that statement isn't just about preaching. It's about everything we do in church. In the last 30 years, we have literally changed everything we do about how to do church. I've been part of that. I've been preaching now for 46 years, and I, and I watched the trend, and I was uh, even uh, helping the trim along in the church that I preached in in Richmond for so long. But I want you to understand that we've changed everything almost that we do about church, all to try to please itching ears, to attract people who have itching ears to what they want to say. Want, want us to say. But rather than attracting people, we need to understand that people are staying away from the church in record numbers. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, there was not a county in America, not one county in America, where the church population was going north. Not one. Where the church population was increasing. The church population in America has been flatlined for two decades. But all around the world, the church is growing like a weed, even during COVID. All across uh, Africa, all across Asia, even in, uh, uh, in, in the Middle East, among Muslims, the church is growing faster even today during COVID than it's ever grown in history. I want somebody to tell me, can uh, anybody guess what the fastest per capita, I'm talking about, the nation per capita in the world that has the fastest uh, uh, growth uh, in the church in the world? Anybody, uh, fastest growing church in the world per capita? Anybody have a guess? Somebody guess. In, not India. They have, they're, they're going fast, but not India. Per capita. Somebody else. England, no. Somebody said China, they're growing like crazy as well. Baptized 21,000 people every day. I, that's a lot of people every, every single day. No, Iran. I, yeah, uh, Iran. Fastest, second fastest growing church uh, per capita, Afghanistan. Now in Iran, the church, is, uh, we're, we're told, will double in the next five years. Will double. And they worship under great persecution. They worship uh, in, in, in out-of-the-way places in secret. The church is led predominantly by women who have left the Muslim faith. And it's understandable. If you understand anything about the Muslim faith, it's the most male-dominated religion in the world. If you're a woman and you're Muslim, I mean, you're lower than the rug on the, on the, on the floor. Uh, on the floor, and they're growing like crazy. But here in America, the church is flatlined. And then we have to ask the question, why? Why? 
I want to give you two biblical images as we're getting close to the end now. Two biblical images that might explain this. The first comes from a very familiar passage of scripture in the book of Revelation where a, this was a church uh, that was uh, very much like the American church. They were very wealthy. Uh, the scripture says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17, they say, uh, Jesus says to them, you have everything you want, you're wealthy, you're very rich, but Jesus says to that church, I stand at the door and knock. Outside, I'm knocking at the door of the church. And if anyone opens the door, I will come in. My friends, uh, the sad reality is, uh, you know, I, I thought that people were staying away from church because of selective fear. That's what I, that's, at first, I just thought that people selectively were choosing where they were afraid to go. Uh, they were afraid to come to church, uh, not, not afraid to go to Walmart. Uh, I, I realized that if you wanted to have a crowd for church, the best place to do it was at the uh, uh, tool department in Home Depot. You know, or, uh, you know that, that's where you always found a crowd, uh, especially when they gave us our $1,200 checks. You know, they gave us our checks, and boom, we're going to spend that. I'm understanding that it's hard, to, uh, you know, wood is tough to come by in some uh, places because we bought so much of it uh, during covid fix things up. I, I, I thought at one time that people were just afraid to come back to church because they had a selective fear. But I think there's probably another reason. Could it be that people aren't flocking back to church? And I'm not just talking about coming physically. I'm talking about people not even watching online because they don't really expect to meet Jesus or his touch in church or at church. So the second conclusion that I just shared with you is that many, many people are, are just not coming back to church. And uh, it may not be their fault. It may be our fault as how we have designed church. One last conclusion that I've come up with during this COVID time is that any church can learn how to welcome Jesus to their gathering. And when they do that, people, people will come back. I want to give you one other image in John chapter uh, uh, 2, uh, and this is this image uh, of, uh, of Jesus' miracle turning water into wine. <clears throat> there are a lot of questions that I have when I get to heaven, but one of the questions that I have when I get to heaven is, Lord, you had all of eternity to choose your first uh, miracle. I, wouldn't it have been raising the dead or healing a vast crowd of people or, or multiplying uh, you know, fish and little loaves of bread to feed a lot of people. Why on earth did you decide uh, to change water into wine? That makes boom, no sense at all to me, especially since I grew up in a teetotaling family in a teetotaling church. Man, uh, that was the craziest thing I've ever heard of in my life. But I want you to notice something. This was a story about a wedding at a, uh, in Cana of Galilee. We don't know anything about the young couple that got married. We don't know anything about the decorations. We don't know anything about the ceremony. But the one thing that we do learn that's incredibly important was this. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited. Everybody say invited. Invited to the wedding. This young couple had the forethought to invite the Lord Jesus Christ to their wedding. And because of that, everything changed about their wedding. Now, I believe every church hopes that when they gather together, that Jesus will be present. Every church hopes that he'll be present. But my friends, hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. In the last 15 years of my local ministry, when I preached at Chester Christian Church, for the last 15 years, I, I, my whole ministry was driven by one question. And that question was, how can we best invite and welcome the Lord Jesus Christ to our worship services as we gather together? As a result of that, I've had the opportunity uh, to develop what I call Embraced Prayer Summits. Uh, would offer that to y'all. They are, are simply a way for us as a uh, church in America to learn what the church all over the world understands. You know, when I first understood 
what the church is doing different around the world than what we do here uh, in America. Uh, I was in Haiti on, a, on a, my first uh, short-term mission trip, uh, and I looked at the itinerary of our trip, and it said on Thursday morning we had to get up uh, early because on the itinerary it said we were going to attend a 4 a.m. prayer service. Now, I thought that had to be a typo because who prays at 4 o'clock in the morning? That's what I thought. But they said, go to bed. We got up and we went out in the village and uh, we heard people cry, praying like I'd never heard praying before in my life. I asked our missionary uh, what they were praying for. And he said they were simply praying that the Lord Jesus would be present with them in worship on Sunday. He told us about one lady that uh, uh, had, had, had had regular attendance uh, at 4 a.m. prayer service, uh, but she didn't have a Bible. And she, that he asked, do you think that our team could buy her a Bible? And I asked, uh, you know, so how many weeks or months has she been faithful in her attendance? And he said, 10 years. She had never missed a 4 a.m. prayer service. And we said, yeah, we think we could buy her a whole truckload of Bibles, you know, that uh, it, she doesn't have a Bible. I saw exactly the same thing in San Pedro Sula, Honduras. And most recently, just a couple years ago, in Indonesia at a youth camp where 400 teenagers finished out their youth camp by spending two hours on their knees asking God to show up in their church on Sunday. Oh, my goodness. What happens when a church begins praying and inviting Jesus to their place? Well, the story in John chapter uh, 2 uh, says two things happen. It says that Jesus changed the water into, into wine, verse 11, and by doing that, he revealed his glory, number one. And number two, people believed that he was the Messiah. How many of us believe that God has not changed? How many of us believe that God has not changed? How many of us believe that Jesus still wants to reveal his glory in his church? How many of us believe that Jesus still wants to be with us when we gather together for worship? My friends, I want you to understand that when we invite him, invite him, invite him to church, Jesus shows up, and Jesus uh, changes everything we do. Now, why does this matter? Why does this matter? I want to show you one video, and I'm done. It's a video of uh, one of our uh, recent church plants a couple years ago uh, in, uh, in uh, a collective Christian church in Frederick, Maryland. Michael Bartlett is the minister doing a lot of the baptisms. I have to tell you this story. Uh, Michael uh, uh, was a teenager uh, the first time he ever went to church, he'd never been to church ever, not one time ever in his lifetime. Uh, he was a junior higher, and uh, his dad got uh, a little flyer in the mail, postcard in the mail, uh, uh, inviting his family, a lot of other people, to a carnival that New Life Christian Church in Centerville, Virginia, uh, was having. That was our second church plant. Your dollars helped make that happen, our second church plant. And so they went to that carnival, that festival, and they did bouncy toys and, uh, you know, ate snow cones and, and ate hot dogs and ate more hot dogs. And on the way home, Michael's dad turns around in the back seat to Michael and his brother and his sister. And he says this, I quote, you kids have eaten so many hot dogs today that we have to go to this church tomorrow to pay penance for all those hot dogs that y'all ate. And for the first time ever in his life, he walked into a church. First time ever in his life. And he heard music that he kind of liked. And he heard the gospel message that changed his life, that there was a God who came in the flesh, dwelt among us, and died on a cross to forgive him of his sins. And Michael and his brother and his sister and his mom and dad were all baptized into Christ. His dad became a an elder at New Life Christian Church for a number of years, and Michael plants a church in Frederick, Maryland called Collective. That's a long backstory to show you this minute and a half video of all the baptisms done at Collective last year. Give a close watch. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. 
I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. 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 Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. 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 My Lord. My Lord. My Lord. My Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. My Savior. And my Savior. And my Savior. Upon that confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why do we do what we do at Waypoint Church Partners? We do everything that we do, including teaching churches how to and welcome and invite Jesus to church because the gospel still changes lives. And the touch of Jesus on the lives of people changes lives forever. With this, I close. You know, the American gospel likes to teach us that if you accept Jesus, everything goes easy, right? How many people have learned that's not the case? Accepting Jesus does not make all problems go away. And one of the young men in that video struggled with addiction his entire high school and adult life. He was baptized in that video, and you saw him two different times in the video. Uh, he gave his life to Christ, he was baptized in Christ uh, last November. And then because of anxiety over COVID, he overdosed on drugs last spring. But my friends, that young man, like all the rest of them, are in heaven uh, and will be in heaven because of what you allow us to do through your gifts. Thank you so much for uh, supporting Waypoint Church Partners. And uh, can I just pray with y'all? Father, I just thank you very, very much for Parkview uh, Christian Church. I thank you for their faithfulness for uh, over 78 years. And I just pray your blessing on them into the future. In Jesus' name.